A man sits in his remote home in the Groningen polder when a new neighbour knocks on the door and introduces himself as Willem van Eyck. He says he works in a mental institution for the criminally insane, not so far away. Later, the man finds out that Willem did not actually work at this institution, but rather he had been a patient there for the last 12 years, and he had just been released unsupervised. Before I start, I would like to ask that if you enjoy my videos, then please hit the like button and subscribe if you are new. It really helps the channel grow. Thank you. So who was Willem van Eyck? There are no images I can find from this era of his life, but Willem was born on August 13th, 1941 in Cortera, but grew up in the town of Ter Ar in South Holland. Willem was the sixth and youngest child and had five older brothers. He also had a little sister, but unfortunately she only turned two years old. The loss of her daughter hurt Willem's mother greatly. She then regularly forced Willem to wear girls clothes and treated him as such. A disturbed relationship with their mother is a very common element in the lives of serial killers. Willem's mother, Adriana, who came from a mentally ill working class family, was undecisive, unkempt, taciturn and withdrawn. What her husband forbid, she would allow her children. Villagers characterised her as unreliable, headstrong, suspicious and cold, just like youngest son Willem. Where people speak negatively about Willem's mother, his father was described as a hard-working man who worked as a petroleum peddler and bicycle repairman. Willem himself was an unruly child who did not do well at school because he could not learn very well. He had a lot of trouble with language. Willem started stealing at a young age, first from his own family, but soon also from neighbors and fellow villagers. He was also cruel to animals. He would hang frogs on the clothesline as a child and shoot them off with a rifle. When Willem saw ducklings, he kicked them to death and drowned cats just for fun. When his uncle went hunting, he went with him and one time accidentally shot a dog. He also set his neighbor's dog on fire after he poured petroleum on the animal. When Willem was still a child, only about seven years old, his brothers described him as evil personified. The description is quite intense but not strange when you look at his behavior towards animals. The psychiatrist J. M. MacDonald believed that cruelty towards animals stemmed from a child's desire to take control of his or her own environment. The desire would arise from the child being humiliated by others, especially adults in authority. This naturally causes frustration in the child, causing her or him to want to unleash these frustrations on something weak and defenseless, for example, a pet. As a child, Willem was already nicknamed Geki Willempy, which translates to Crazy Little William, and the nickname stuck with him for a long time. He had a lot of guts, and therefore was not afraid. He always came across as menacing. He threatened to use force to get his way. One time, he took a grenade into a pub and demanded free beer. Whenever he argued with someone, he threatened to fetch his gun. A fellow villager spoke about how Willem stood at the bar 
and started fumbling in the pocket of his jacket. Suddenly, he took his rifle out of his pocket and placed it on the bar. It did not take long before William had to deal with the law in connection with committing theft and burglaries. In 1964, he got a criminal record and in 1966, he went to prison for a few months. He was given a psychiatric examination by order of the court. It was concluded that he was aggressive and lacked normal levels of intelligence. Willem showed deviant behavior from an early age. Incidentally, this behavior was always dismissed by others as something that was normal for him because he was just Gecky Willempy. No one else seemed to really think about how bizarre his behavior was. In addition, Willem mainly displayed macho behavior towards men, as if he wanted to show that he was a real man. Because of this behavior, Willem was lonely and felt ostracized. Where he acted tough with men, he was aloof with women. Contact with women was therefore difficult. This is of course due to his own behavior because women simply thought he was a creep. In his early 20s, he started having vivid dreams about women, in which he destroyed women by slitting their stomachs. In audio recordings, Willem says that he wanted to be in charge of the woman. She had to be subordinate to him, and that he kept having to push the boundaries. In his own words, cover, have, destroy. So it started with vivid dreams, but soon they were no longer enough. Willem wanted action. He wanted reality. His behavior eventually escalated when he picked up his first victim on June 20th, 1971. 15 year old Cora Mantel. Cora is described as naive and adventurous, but that's not strange for a 15 year old. She sometimes hitchhiked from Amsterdam with friends. On June 20th, 1971, Cora had returned to Amsterdam to visit her boyfriend. After their evening together, her boyfriend took her to the bus stop. At the bus stop, they found out that they had missed the last bus. Cora therefore decided to hitchhike back home. She was okay with this, as she had done it before. Unfortunately, Cora was picked up by Willem, who had just been drinking beers at a cafe in Amsterdam. At the time, Willem lived alone and went out looking for women at night. When he saw Cora hitchhiking on the side of the road, he saw this as a unique opportunity. He said, she offered me another cigarette, a menthol. I already decided for myself that I was going to kill her and when I took a different road than she indicated and stopped there, I said to her, let's say goodbye to each other. When she refused and tried to get out of the car, that's when the accident happened. Willem then forced himself on her, but she resisted. He then essayed Cora and strangled her with her own scarf. He said, there I undressed her and threw her in a ditch with her clothes there. Later, I told police that I had sex with her, but that is not true, only after she was dead, once. Later, I heard that she had been caught from behind. Then you have sunk deep. In any case, it wasn't me. Cora's naked body was found the next day, on June 21st, 1971. After finding her body, it took more than 10 hours before police could identify her. They finally succeeded thanks to a repair mark engraved on her watch. The police immediately started looking for a possible perpetrator and a jeweler from Alasmere was suspected for a while. This was because Cora was due to start her new job at this jeweler's the morning of the murder. Cora's father was willing to hand out 10,000 guilders in reward money for a tip leading to an arrest. This was on top of the 15,000 guilders from the public prosecutor. 
Unfortunately, this did not yield any results because the police did not proceed further with the investigation. Cora was buried on June 25th, 1971. Before we continue, I want to say thank you to Modified Zombie Mermaid Art, who brought this case to my attention. They have recently set up a new Instagram account showing their artwork, so please take a minute to go check them out and give them a follow. Because the police did not get any further in their investigation, Willem was able to continue his life peacefully. A few years after Cora's murder, he strikes again on August 19th, 1974. Willem saw his second victim, the 44-year-old nurse, Alcha van der Platt from Gronicum. Alcha had gone to church in Ter Aar with her family members and decided to take a walk after the service. She happened to be walking past Willem's houseboat when he spotted her from his upper deck. When Willem saw her, he decided to strike. He grabbed a knife, jumped on his moped and went after Alcha. Like Cora, Alcha also resisted Willem, but this time made his real dream come true. He essayed her, strangled her, slit her throat, cut her stomach open and cut off her left breast. It is therefore striking that he did not cut Cora open, as this had been his fantasy for some time. Experts believe this is because Cora was his first victim. You see this more often with serial killers, that their first murder differs in execution from their later murders. Later in an interview, Willem said, I just want to say I didn't have sex with her, and I didn't, er, uh, you know, I did touch her. She was still a virgin. She never dated a man. She didn't say anything, didn't scream. She lay on the floor. I stabbed her quite unexpectedly, once, right into her heart. She died instantly. I'm a hunter. I know how to sting. I stabbed three or four times after that. Not anymore. Then I cut her stomach open, but I didn't feel her bowels, as the police said. Nor did I cut off a breast. That was just a nipple. Alcha's badly beaten naked body was found in a cornfield, not far from Ter Aar. She was covered with deep cuts and stab wounds. When her body was found, Alcha's face looked pained. Not surprising when you consider what she had to endure. Several people saw Willem driving near the crime scene on the night of the murder on his moped. As a result, the police quickly tracked down Willem and arrested him the next day. After his arrest, Willem was of course extensively interrogated. Initially, the interrogation was difficult, but eventually he confessed. Not only the murder of Alchi, but also the murder of Cora. The police themselves had apparently made a link between the two murders, and they brought this up during the interrogation. Willem confessed, probably in the hope of getting a milder sentence. Willem was first sentenced to 20 years in prison, but on appeal this became 18 years, plus TBR. This is the Dutch version of a psychiatric hospital. The reason no life sentence was given is because both murders were deemed impulsive as part of his sentence. Willem was admitted to the Van Mesdag Clinic in 1975. Here, people with narcissistic, antisocial and or paranoid personality disorders are treated. These are people who fall under the most severe mental illness and who are the most difficult to treat. The Van Mesdag Clinic is comparable with Broadmoor Hospital. In this clinic, Willem was of course analysed, and here the conclusion was drawn that he is a dangerous and unscrupulous person. It didn't help that Willem refused to take medication, 
and also refused to go to therapy. As a result, he strongly opposed his own treatment. And because of his behavior, he often ended up in solitary confinement and got into a lot of fights. He was by all means untreatable. In 1979, Willem was allowed on supervised leave for the first time, something that is regulated by law and is part of the treatment. He had actually been allowed to go on leave before, but that could not go ahead because of his behavior. According to Willem, this was because he was being opposed by his practitioners. Nevertheless, he was finally allowed to go on leave in 1979. He went to a strip club with an attendant. In this club, he went upstairs with a stripper against the rules. As punishment, his supervised leave was withdrawn for a certain period. In March 1980, Willem decided to place a personal ad in the local paper. Willem may have limited intelligence, but he was not stupid. He knew that a relationship would look good in front of his practitioners. In the advertisement, Willem wrote that he was a driver who was often abroad. Soon, there was a response to his contact ad. Adri, a single mother of five, read the ad in the newspaper and wanted to meet. So they quickly set up a date. They were supposed to meet at a train station in Groningen, but Willem did not show up, supposedly because he was abroad. A few days later, someone from the Van Mesdag clinic was at Adri's door, asking her not to contact Willem anymore. Despite the request not to contact Willem, Adri decided to do so after a week. In her own words, this was because she was stubborn. She also wanted to visit out of curiosity. During the visit, Willem told her why he was in the clinic. Although she was shocked by this, this did not stop her from contacting him again. She had the idea that she had to build a new life with him and this suited Willem because having a wife made it easier for him to keep up appearances that he could function in society. They became engaged in 1981 and married in prison in 1982. Incidentally, Adri lied to her family about what Willem was imprisoned for. On June 6th, 1990, it was decided that Willem could be discharged from the clinic and that his TBS would be lifted. A report concluded that after years of struggling, his problems had not been treated and that he would have an antisocial personality with a psychotic core. It was acknowledged that he always resisted his treatment throughout his stay. As a result, his traumas from early childhood would not have been processed. Despite this, it was concluded that this would not mean that he had not changed. According to the practitioners, Adri was an important emotional support, but a severe trauma, like a divorce, would reopen the wounds of early childhood and reactivate the psychotic core in his personality. Despite all these conclusions, Willem was released without any guidance. He was also under no surveillance since he was released. Together with Adri, Willem moved to a small farm just outside the Groningen village of Harksteed. The choice to live somewhere outside was a conscious one because Willem was an outdoorsman who loved hunting and didn't know anything about social control. This also suited Adri because she worked for an animal ambulance and was called when people had to get rid of animals. They had space for this on their farm. According to Adri, Willem was fond of animals. The animal ambulance also regularly employed interns, including young girls of about 15 or 16 years of age. Willem harassed these girls by being very pushy and making unsuitable remarks. These red flags were not noticed by Adri, 
Still, the relationship between Willem and Adri went downhill after about 18 months. They got into a fight more often and Willem started drinking more and more. According to Willem, Adri refused to be intimate with him, but it is rather that Adri refused to do specific things he wanted to do. According to Adri, Willem was often on his moped to visit street workers. He was therefore regularly found on the streetwalker zone. Adri and Willem had been living in Harksteed for some time, when on November 5th, 1993, the naked body of Romanian street worker Michelle Fattel was found in a ditch in the village of Enmatil, about 26 kilometers from Harksteed. An investigation revealed that she had been strangled. A neighborhood investigation was immediately launched, but this turned up nothing due to a lack of eyewitnesses. In addition, it is also difficult to speak to any witnesses because they were not open about their visits to the local street walking zone. Michelle is William's first confirmed victim after he was released and settled in Harksteed. William claims that he can no longer remember the date or day that he committed the murder, but that it was during the day and under a railway viaduct. He had picked her up on the street walk with his car. On January 21st, 1995, the body of 31-year-old Annalise Reinders from Harlingen was found in the Eames Canal in Appingen Dam, also about 26 kilometers from Harksteed. Like Michelle, Annalise was also a street worker. When her body was found, Annalise had been missing for six weeks. She was essayed, and strangled with a rope around her neck. Just like Michelle, Willem had picked her up on the street walk with his car. Willem said about the Annalise attack, a plump, plump girl, no beauty. But that night, I had little choice. I laid my blanket there on the floor, on a dam. And when she had undressed herself, we lay down and caressed and touched and kissed. The great foreplay, so to speak, and then the same thing happened again. Without having sex, I suddenly, as if in a blackout, put my hands around her neck. When I came to my senses, I was on my knees next to her, and she was dead. She must have resisted, because she scratched my face. As he was dumping her body, a police car passed. He said this, They have been looking at me for a while. I farted seven colours of crap but they drove on without checking me. Those men could have made a very good turn. Unfortunately, sex workers are easy victims for those with sinister needs. There was a rule that ladies were not allowed to leave the street walking lane, but they did at the risk of their own lives. It remains a danger if you just get into someone's car because you immediately make yourself vulnerable but it's hard to turn down a good offer when you really need the money. This was often the case for street workers, as many had drug addictions. In 1998, the relationship between Willem and Adri finally broke down. They had another huge fight, but for the first time, Willem had physically hurt Adri. He had beaten her. This was the last straw for Adri, so she decided she wanted to leave him. This didn't come easy. Her children arranged for her to find a home through her GP, and they took her away from the farm she shared with Willem. After Adri's departure, Willem regularly invited street workers to his home. He had lost his driver's license and car because of his excessive drinking so all he had left was his moped. But, with a moped, you can't exactly pick up street workers from the street walking zone, so instead, he called them up and had them come to his farm directly. On July 17th, 2001, the naked body of 34-year-old street worker, Sasha Schenker, was found in the Schlockter dip, not far from Harksteed. 
she had been missing for a week by then. The last thing known is that she borrowed a scooter and was never seen again. Many tips came in about the possible perpetrator and there were many rumors and gossip. Willem was a regular customer of Sasha and she went to his house at his request. Willem claims that Sasha slept on the couch at his home for a few hours. He woke her up and asked her not to go to work. Then suddenly, he hit her on the head with a beer bottle, just on a whim. He claimed he panicked and strangled her with his hands. Her funeral was well attended. With her death, Sasha's son was taken from his mother. Sasha was the fourth missing street worker found in the water. Police did not know who the perpetrator was. Strangely, they did not believe it was a serial killer, but saw it as separate incidents. By talking to the street workers, a small farm in Harksteed came into the picture where street workers regularly went. They claimed they could always call the person who lived there if money was needed because something could always be arranged. Willem's history was already known to the police, so they had him in their sights pretty quickly. A phone conversation revealed that Sasha had been at Willem's home the night before she went missing. As a result, Willem was invited as a witness by the police, but he denied having anything to do with her death. He was also not seen as a suspect because he was not the last person who had called Sasha. He was questioned by police for two hours, but was allowed to leave. After Sasha was found in the water, police decided to dive there. This resulted in the discovery of a piece of clothing in a plastic bag, so the search continued. Finally, three bags of clothing were found, weighted down with boulders. One contained Sasha's clothing, and it's suspected the other clothing in the other bags belonged to Michelle and Annalise. Willem's house was found directly next to the water where the bags of clothing were found. But this wasn't quite enough to arrest Willem yet. Several therapists who have treated Willem in the past tipped off the Groningen police that Willem could be responsible for the murders but he was known to police as a cutter and not a strangler. Nevertheless, the police decided to go to Ter Ar to investigate the murders of Cora and Alcha. When they found out that Cora's cause of death was strangulation, a light finally came on. The link was only really made when it turned out that Cora's and Alcha's clothes were also found in the water near his houseboat, in bags that were weighted with boulders. Willem was finally arrested on November 12, 2001. Willem was of course interviewed, but hard evidence was also used. It turned out that Willem used a very specific type of rope to secure fish traps in order to fish for eels. This very specific rope was also used to kill Annalise. When this connection was made, it didn't take long before Willem confessed to the murders of Michelle, Annalise and Sasha. The Groningen police were very proud of the work they had done and that they had arrested Willem, but it cannot be ruled out that he committed more murders, especially because of the gap of six to seven years between the murders of Annalise and the murder of Sasha. It is therefore plausible that Willem committed more murders than he confessed, or for which he was tried. During the period that Willem was active, many street workers in the region went missing or were killed. After Willem's arrest and confession, several murders of street workers have been re-examined. The following three women are thought to be possibly victims of Willem. On July 31st, 1995, the torso of 24-year-old Antoinette Bont was found in the Winchester Deep, about 17 kilometers from Harksteed. 
Her arms and legs were later found in a bag. Her head was never recovered. On May 2nd, 1997, the body of Shirley Heerages was found in Groningen. The cause of death turned out to be strangulation. A scarf was later found in Willem's house with Shirley's blood on it. It was known that he knew her and that she was murdered. Around February 7th, 1998, 35-year-old Yolanda Mir went missing. She was last seen on that day. The police launched a major investigation that was cut short after three weeks. Yolanda's parents did not let it go and went out themselves to speak to street workers in Friesland, Groningen, and even in Germany. It is known that Yolanda often visited Willem's house, and Willem also admitted to having known her. According to Adri, Yolanda was fed to their swine. After Yolanda went missing, no one was allowed near the boar. In fact, a few weeks later, the boar was taken to the slaughterhouse. In 2003, very thorough DNA research was again done in Willem's farm and in his yard. Unfortunately, apart from the scarf with Shirley's blood, nothing was found that linked Willem to possible other victims. Willem has never acknowledged any murders other than the five that he has been tried for. He also never wanted to talk about his motive for the murders. He kept claiming that it happened every time on a whim. Willem also put blame on others, or at least anything other than himself. He had a rough childhood. He had been bullied. He acted on spur of the moment. Despite never blaming himself, he said during an interrogation that he had realized during a murder that he had to press on because the victim would otherwise go to the police. This admission ensured that he could be tried for murder because it showed that he thought about the consequences of his act and went ahead with it anyway. On November 7th, 2002, the court in Groningen sentenced William to life imprisonment. He continued to cause problems in prison. He was unmanageable. As a result, he was transferred several times to other prisons. In 2019, he was transferred again due to serious behavioral problems and so ended up in Vought. Here, he passed away on June 19th, 2019. The Public Prosecution Service does not want to make a statement about the cause of death. To William Van Eyck, good riddance. To the viewers, that's all we've got time for in this episode. Until next time, stay sane.